when we both lean back, the boat tips and starts taking on water. Now we're in the middle of the lake and the boat was only riding in the water about that much liberty. So here we go and we sink the boat in the middle of the lake. Now do I swim? Yeah. I mean, I can get from here to there. But do I swim across the lake? No. Good news, proportionate to the level of the trouble. I'm in big trouble. John Bynum, because of his girth, was especially buoyant. And John, I remember John said, don't talk, don't kick, just ride. He had me by the collar and brought me to the shore. Good news is better news based on the depth of despair of the trouble. I remember another foolish thing when I jumped out of an airplane. Having had proper training, I thought, not with, uh, I didn't tandem jump. I was tied to a, to a line that was a rip cord, and so I jumped, and my first shoot, first jump did not open. Well, it opened, but it was tangled. Tangled so terribly, I was in a spin and couldn't find left from right. And with the parachute, your, your, your reserve chute is on the left shoulder. And so I'm spinning. Now, we're only jumping from 3,500 feet just around the clouds. We're not, you don't have a lot of time to goof around. And so I can't find my left shoulder because the chute is tangled and I'm spinning. And then finally, I find the reserve chute and pull it. The first, cut, the first chute is cut away and the second chute opens, deploys perfectly, and I land miles off course in a v large patch of honeysuckle. And I'm smelling the honeysuckle, and I thought, am I dead? <laughs> I'm not dead. But I was thinking, oh my goodness, how wonderful the reserve shoot. The gospel is the good news. It's good news to you in proportion to you understand the bad news. The bad news that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that one day we will stand in judgment before Almighty God, but we don't need to do that. Not necessary. Jesus stood in our place. He was buoyant more than John Bynum. He was sufficient more than the secondary shoot. Jesus saves all who will believe upon Him and trust Him only. This is the good news. And it's for all the nations. So we've got all these baptisms today, and uh, that's wonderful. But I'm going to stop at 10 minutes till. So here is my discipline, and hit pray for me here. <laughs> Let's look first of all at what is this good news? The whole, God, the whole epistle of Romans is about good news. It's a very theological book. It's a personal book. Paul didn't start the church at, at Rome, but Rome was the major, the major city in the Roman Empire. Paul didn't start it. Paul and no, one, no theologians know who it was that started the church at Rome. But Paul, being the theologian of the church, was so very concerned to send the good news, the proper doctrine, the right theology to those believers there. And so we're studying here week by week. Uh, this, God, this, this work of Romans. So we're just beginning it. So you haven't missed much if you're new. And we're talking about the gospel, this good news to the nations. And I won't be able to do this whole section today. We'll do some more next week and the following weeks. But I do want you to think about what is good news. I said good news is in proportion to your understanding of your need. And uh, the worse the bad news, the better the good news that is the remedy. With all that in mind, let's think then, the good news is what? When the Bible talks about the gospel being good news, what is it? The gospel is what? A couple of passages for you. John 3, 16 through 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. How about we read all of this together out loud? Can you do it? Let's read together. Read with me. For God so loved the world 
that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not judged. The one who does not believe in him has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the gospel. What is the good news? God loves you. Say, hey, who does God love? You know what? You can say God loves the world. Yes. God loves the Jews. Yes. God loves the peoples of all the nations. You could say yes. More importantly, as it relates to you, God loves you. When I was sinking in the lake, I appreciate the love universal of God for all of his creation. Appreciate it greatly. But the necessary grace I needed was to be found in a personal love, a rescue for a person, me, in a deep despair and trouble. And God's love is not just theoretical. It's not systematic theology. This is not what philosophers and theologians sit around and talk about. The gospel, the good news you need, is what gospel? What is this gospel? It's the gospel for you. You say, man, I've messed up. My sins are against me. I know that. I know I've lied. I've cheated. I've, I've, uh, I've manipulated. I've not lived as God made me to live. I know I'm a sinner. You say, well, I don't want to be a sinner, but I know I'm a sinner. And so the gospel you need, this good news is for you. It's a personal good news. This good news, personal good news. You say, well, how, how personal is it? It means that whatever your concoction of trouble and sin and despair has been, God's gospel is sufficient for your concoction of sin and Paul problems. You say, well, here's my list. I did this, this, and this. I did this, this, and this. Whatever your list is, the good news is sufficient for you. God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, not yet. God first sent his Son into the world to die for the sins of the world. And how about that? What is this good news? This good news is the gospel is personal, effective, sufficient for your issues. You say, well, you don't know my issues. I don't care what your issues are. We've already determined. Paul said he was the chief of sinners. If God could save the worst of the worst, then he can take care of us. Praise be to God. The good news is what? Not only is it personal. The good news is Christ came into the world to save sinners. Christ came into the world to save sinners. All the important people in the world that go from place to place are looking for prestige and honor. When a dignitary goes to visit a dignitary in another country, they roll out the red carpet. When Jesus came into the world of woe, we rolled out our worst and most venomous sinful natures. He came preaching good news to the weary and the brokenhearted. But the religious people who saw him and heard him rejected him and called him a son of the devil and they crucified him. This is human nature to reject this beautiful good news. But Jesus came into the world not for the important, not for the rich, not for the famous, not for those with social media influence. Jesus came into the world for people like me who jump out of airplanes when they shouldn't and skip school when they shouldn't. Jesus came into the world for sinners. How many of you qualify? Yeah. I think one of the greatest things you could do, you say, well, I'm just beginning my faith journey. One of the things you ought to do today and every day of your life is to say, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Admitting that you have failed the creator that made you. You have failed to live up to what he made you to be. You say, well, I'm a pretty good guy. I'm not as bad as my brother or my cousin. You ought to know Luigi down the street. Oh, Luigi, right. You ought to know them. No, no, no. We don't come to God and say, I'm not as bad as someone else. We come to God and say, you made me special, purposeful, uniquely for your glory, and I failed you. Have mercy upon me, a sinner. So you think, well, hey, I'm just beginning my faith journey. So, let, let, me, let me give you this great advice. Just say to God, be merciful to me. I know I'm a sinner. I'm trying to figure it out. I want to believe. If you're a real God, I want to believe. 
In the meantime, be merciful to me, a sinner. And God is the captain of mercy. He's a gracious God, a God who loves and saves all who believe in him. The good news is that Jesus came for sinners, not important people. You say, well, I'm an important person. Well, then you better be careful. So I'm a rich person. Well, you better be especially careful. Harder is it for you to enter the kingdom of heaven than a camel to go through the eye of a needle. It's because of pride. Come to me, Jesus said, like a little child. They're humble, humble. Come to me like, like the little children. Trusting in Jesus. Okay, that's the good news is what? The good news is from whom? The good news is from whom? Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel. What? Of God. The gospel is from whom? It's from God. One of the reasons I know that the gospel is true is because man would never invent a system where the humble are exalted and the exalted are humble. Human nature, human thinking, would never create a system where the last will be first and the first will be last. This Jesus who came preaching, repent and be baptized. Repent and believe the gospel. He was preaching this thing to all sinners who could come and say, here am I, helpless and hopeless, weary and wandering, unknowing where I'm going, but trusting that you will guide me, gentle Savior. Gentle shepherd, shepherd, lead me. Oh, gentle shepherd, lead me. What kind of gospel is this? This is a gospel to the whole world. This is a gospel to the nations. This is a gospel for people of every tribe and tongue and skin color and every language. This gospel knows no boundaries. This gospel knows no boundaries of social uh, requirements to entry. This is not a social club where you have to pay a fee to join. This is not a club of community where you have to keep the rules and say, oh, I'm doing all that I'm responsible for to be a part of the family. This is an adopted family by grace alone, through faith alone, to all the nations throughout the whole world. That's why it's good news. It's good news. It's not only just good news for the nations. Don't hear this as a sermon to the nations. This is good news for me. A kid drowning in the lake. This is good news for me. A kid falling from the sky. This is good news for everyone who will say, be merciful to me, a sinner. The good news is from whom? It's from the God of mercy. It's not from human beings. This is not from corporate America. This is not from the educational system. This is not from the ivory tower. This is not from the blue blood streets of Boston. This is not from the hoity-toity streets of Charleston. This is the gospel to all the nations for all who are sinners who will come and believe. And so we'll get to heaven one day and you'll say, oh my goodness, they let anybody in. And they'll look at you and say, yes, they do. What a wonderful gospel. What a wonderful gospel. What kind of gospel do you want? You want one where you can pay your way in? You want one where you can work your way in? You want one where your family of origin can get you in? What kind of gospel do you want? You say to someone who doesn't believe, what kind of gospel do you want? If they dreamed up a gospel, if they thought of one like the perfect one, if someone could think that it could apply to anyone at any time, any age, any race, any demographic, what kind of gospel would a person want? This gospel of grace from the Father, through the Son, to the sinners who cried and said, be merciful to me. Adopt me into your family. And then Father says, come on. This is a beautiful gospel. From whom? It's from God. It's for whom? What is it? It's a gospel for sinners. Who's it from? It's from God who created it, designed it. Who is the gospel for? And Jesus answered and said to them, 
It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners, sinners to repentance. Who's it for? Us. All have sinned and fallen short. <clears throat> you say, well, Jesus said, I... The, the righteous people don't need a physician. Well, people don't need a physician. Well, no one's well. Not really. We think we're well. And that's why we need to admit that we have failed our Creator. Our Creator made us for His glory, for His purposes. Our Creator made us for Him. And we live as if our lives are given to us. We think we can enter this world on our own and exit on our own, uh, uh, on our own, and in between it's on our own. Well, how many of you know that you didn't create yourself and you won't pick the moment when you leave this world, but we live like we do. Jesus said, it's not the well who need a physician, but the sick. I said to you, what you ought to do? You say, hey, I'm working on my, my walk with God. Be merciful to me, a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Be the physician to me. I know I am sick. Who's, this gospel is for whom? It's for those who are sick. And this gospel is for whom? Further, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 for consider your calling, brethren. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble of birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. This gospel is for whom? It is for sinners. It's from whom God who designed a beautiful, gracious gift. Look at this passage. I think it's a very important passage. To the nations. We can say to everyone in the nations. I don't care if you're from a poor country, a rich country. And we can say to every, every, every child in this room. We don't care if your family is nurturing or your family is difficult. We don't care if you've had an easy journey in your life as a young adult or adult or a difficult one. You're an abuse victim or you've gone along and thrived. You've gone to college or you didn't. You went to the military or you did not. Whoever you are, this gospel is calling out to you and saying, come and be a part of my family because I love you. I want you to receive who you were made to be. Well, how many people actually take up God's and obey God's command. We all know people who, who, who live their whole Christian life and, and they're very determined and very uh, dedicated to it. And they die and we have their funeral and we praise God for them. And then we know other people whose Christian life is like, eh, I did something when I was a kid, I, I hope it works. The Bible says that the people who really get it normally are what kind of people? Look at the passage. It says that um, they're not normally wise according to the world. Uh, not many are powerful. Not many are noble of birth. Verse 27. God chooses what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised of the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. I'm just one not. I'm a not. Say, well, who are you? Are you, are, you, are you a somebody? No, I'm a not. A believer, really, according to the passage, is a not. You're not very important. You're not very prestigious. You're not very famous in the world. Most of us aren't. God, by His grace, chooses some people that are. But for the most part, most people who follow as a disciple of Jesus, forsaking all things in this world to follow Jesus, most of them are the nots. And then God chooses the knots to make a blasphemy of those who think they are. So be a knot. If God's going to take the knots and ashamed those who say they are the ours, they, God will choose the knots to bring to nothing the things that are. And what's the last part of it? Verse 29, read with, it, read with me. Verse 20, why would God choose the knots to, 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 to put to shame the ours? 
the important ones. Verse 29, read it. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. This is why the gospel that God created and God designed said everybody's welcome to come, but nobody will come importantly. Nobody will come to the cross importantly. Everyone who comes to the cross must come humbly. We'll bring nothing with us. Family of origin, bank account records, stock investments. You'll bring nothing with you to the cross. But when you reach the judgment, none of this earthly thing is going to do you any good. You'll come to the cross with nothing. Or you'll go to the judgment with everything only to lose it all. And then, oh, my soul, tonight your soul shall be required of you. For whom is it? And then lastly, uh, the good news glorifies whom? Verse 4 and 5 of Romans 1. And Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. This good news, it's for whom? Who does it glorify? It's for us, for our benefit. Who gets the credit and glory for it? Like we just read, because God's not choosing the important people of the world, he's choosing the humble people of the world so that he may confound the wise. He may make the knots more prominent than the R's and he will make the R's ashamed of their pride so that we cannot boast, all this is true. Then who gets the glory? God does, because we cannot boast in our own flesh. We can't say, oh, I earned my way to heaven. There won't be a single one of you who get to heaven who could say to God, aren't you impressed? Do you remember when? Did you watch me when I did this? Did you hear the sermon? Did you see the offering I gave? Did you see me help that poor person? And okay, I'm, I'm in. Oh, no, no, no. No one will get to heaven and ever say to God, did you see me win? We will all get to heaven, bowing on our faces before Christ and saying, only by your merit are we here. Only by you, only by your sacrifice, only because you died for us, do we have an entrance into your eternal kingdom. And all for the glory of God. And Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship. Paul's talking about himself. We've all received grace. All of us don't receive apostleship. This was a long time ago. Paul was an apostle. You are not. I'm not. Um, receive grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. I think, I don't know what I'm going to do next week. Next week's Easter. We'll have all kinds of visitors next week. You know, people who come to church on Easter only. That's fine. I get that. I, I know where you are. I, I, I get that. I'm not criticizing you. But I'm thinking, what am I going to do? Because I got some hard stuff to say. I mean, I... I what do we do with verse 5? To bring about the obedience of faith? We want to say that faith is simply something that we grab a ticket for, put it in our pocket, and get on the subway headed to glory. Now, faith who has no works is dead, the Scripture says. How do we get saved? Is it something we do? No. No. We don't do anything to get to heaven. Jesus does it all. But faith in Jesus isn't like that we just have it in our brain. No, this is a faith that acts. This is a faith that works. This is a faith that has fruit. Over and over we hear the scriptures say, if you have no fruit, how will, we know the, how will we know the legitimacy of the tree? By the fruit. You'll know a good tree by its fruit. So you say, well, hey, you know what? I was a kid. I got, I got baptized as a kid, whatever. I'm good with God. No. 
If you have no faith right now in Jesus, sufficient that it produces works in your life, you got to really question your faith. Is my faith legitimate? This says, Paul said, my life, call, Paul said, my calling in life is to bring about obedience of faith for the sake of his glory. Silent faith, how does that bring any glory to the nations? Say, okay, I've got some faith in my, I have my own spirituality. It produces no fruit. How's that going to bring any glory? How's that going to bring any glory that the whole nations would know? See the problem? And that's my problem for next week. But that's my problem. Y'all pray for me here. <laughs> for today, here's, here's where we are. Listen to me now. The obedience of faith is the faith so substantial in your life that it causes you to act and bear fruit. If you have no good fruit, then there's something wrong with the root of the tree. Good trees bear good fruit. You say, well, hey, I, 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 I prayed the prayer the preacher told me to pray. I don't care who told you what. If you do not believe the gospel so completely that it causes you to bear fruit of righteousness, you better check the root, see if the root is, is, is legitimate. Um, we're having these baptisms. The kids are coming, I hope, I told them. We're having these baptisms. What is baptism? I was talking this week to a former military guy, and I, I'd done some study in military thinking. I've never been in the military, but I was thinking about the military. And uh, as it relates to baptism, what if your commanding officer, well, first of all, how many of you were in the military? Personally, you were in the military. All right, several of you. Your commanding officer says to you, we, it is necessary, it is vital, it is of first importance that we take that, 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 that position across that bridge. We are in a spot where we must take that position across that bridge. And when we take it, we cannot return. We're going to blow up the bridge behind us. We're going to take it, and then we're going to go forward to the next uh, objective. And so the soldier, being soldiers, they understand the ideas of authority, and they know there, there's a reason why we must take that position right now and why we cannot return. And they want the bridge blown up behind us so that no one can follow us and that we cannot return to the other safety, the other land. So the soldier looks out, and at all cost, he extends his life for the service of his country. With his comrades, they cross the bridge, and they begin to take their position. And after taking it, they destroy the bridge behind them. There is no going back to the other land. There is a position to take, and there's a new position after that one, and a new position after that one, until the war is won. Christians, when you truly give your life to Christ, it's like blowing up that bridge. You're going to cross the bridge. These people are crossing a bridge today in their baptism. They're being buried with Christ in the likeness of His death. They're dying. The bridge is being blown. And they're occupying. The new life is being possessed. There is no life in the old land. In the wilderness of old, there is no prosperity in Christ. It is a gone place from our hearts and minds. This is the true disciple. We're going to blow up the bridge of worldliness. We're going to blow up the bridge of attachment to this present world. We're going to blow up the bridge to our, to our sinful affections that hold us trapped in this world. We're going to blow up the bridge. And so baptism is a symbol where we're getting in our mind there's something to conquer and there's an old place to desert and, and, and to move away from. Praise be to God by His Spirit. We can take the position and we can forget the old land and move into the promised land. This is baptism. And so 
for those persons coming today. This is what they're attempting to do. Pray for them, will you? And then some of you, you really need to get your own mind where you stop playing with God. You, you're like, I joined the church when I was a kid. I did, jumped all through this stuff. I'm talking about a faith where all of this world is passing away and you're not holding it tightly. You're living with open hands only to seek God's beauty and God's glory and God's wonder. And part of your problem and the frustration of your Christian walk is you just won't loose this world. You're like, oh, I've got to keep doing that or I've got to keep doing that. Yeah, that's your problem. Blow up the bridge. Move into kingdom land. God will be pleased and He will be sufficient. When you get across the bridge, you think there's something b better back there. That's what Israel did. They wanted the simple, the simple vegetables, the onions, garlics, and leeks. And here was beautiful manna in the promised land. Turn loose of it all for kingdom glory. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, help us now. We, uh, we, we need an interaction with you. We've got all these people coming forward and saying they're, they're, they're ready and willing to, to follow you at all cost. And we pray that you would fill them with your spirit and help them. Those here that are perhaps visiting, they say, okay, uh, I'm not used to people telling me about Jesus like that. Well, that's okay. Uh, maybe this was God's appointment for you. You're like, okay, I need to believe. I do believe, and I should stop playing games with God. Well, I hope you will stop. <laughs>